opinions of the hosts on KDWN are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of this station, its management, or Beasley Media Group. This is Market Snapshot with Dan French from Nova Home Loans with the latest information about home loans in Las Vegas. Now, here's Dan French. to the market snapshot this is dan french from nova home loans i am your go-to loan expert here in las vegas and i'm here today with my friend chuck it's crucible again from simply vegas what's going on today chuck i'm doing good how you doing today doing great we got another guest here rory vowinkle he's from bulldog bankruptcy how you doing today i'm good as always it's a pleasure and a privilege to educate the las vegas community we wanted to say a happy 4th of July weekend to everybody that's out there. Nice. Did you know on 4th of July, 1776, uh, the 13th colony claimed the independence from England and eventually led to uh, inform the United States? I know that. That's cool. Yeah. Also, ton of fireworks last night. I went over. I was driving uh, over next to uh, the Green Valley Ranch Casino. Yeah. I think they got a better show than the Strip. Was it free? <laughs> it was free. I mean, you, but you should have seen it. Everybody outside on the on the streets and things were looking at it, yeah. and it was it was great because that's the only place that I seen mm-hmm. where people were camping out and they were actually watching those fireworks. Oh, nice! So it was, it was pretty nice. I think I might go do that next year. So, also we have a, a ton of events going on this week. What's going on? Do you have any events here, Chuck? Observers watch strict new construction defect. This article actually talks about townhomes and condo lawsuits against developers in 2008, where they actually um, there's a lawsuit for two million dollars. Uh, fees were actually paid out to. Mm-hmm. And uh, remember, we actually talked about this, where there was a bunch of schemes going on with these HOAs. Yeah. And the uh, FBI was actually involved. Since that taken place in 2006 to 2012, there's actually been an increase at 355 percent of uh a lawsuit's taking place. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Now, let me ask you this. I mean, while that's taking place, I mean, don't you think this is going to affect the the buyers that are looking to purchase a I, condo? Yeah, I think it's going to be big. Condos are already hard to finance as it is. Yeah. And with this in place, it's even going to be harder. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end of the show as well. Um, also, we have the World Series of Poker Championship going on over at the Rio. $10,000 buy-in. $10,000. But uh, how much do you make? Well, I think it's millions of dollars. I think it's up towards like the ten million range, I believe. You know what? You're abso- what pay out. You're absolutely right. I was actually taking a look at looking at this in nineteen forty nine there was a gentleman by the uh name of Nicholas. He actually went to uh Benyon's, right, the owner of the horseshoe casino and said, Hey, let's hold up a tournament. Yeah. And actually him and another gentleman by the name of Johnny Moss actually were at the final two. Mm-hmm. And uh it took them five months to get this uh, tournament done. Actually, all they did was eat, sleep, and just play poker. After five months, uh, Johnny Moss actually won $2 million in prizes. If I'm going to take a, a, a position and say, you know what, I'm going to go gamble. I'm not a gambler. All right? mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, always, I'm one of those guys that always watch the, that money that I put down. Yeah. And it's like one of those things where if I lose, I get mad. And depressed? <laughs> depressed, <laughs> mad. You know, I want to punch the wall. Yeah. And uh, so what I do is I try to not do that. But if I was going to gamble, yeah, it would definitely be something like Texas Hold'em or poker because I think you have better odds and there is a little bit more strategy to trying to get that and, and obviously get, you know, some type of winnings from it. Have you played before? Yeah, I played. What about you, Rory? Uh, I played a little bit of poker, and I get wiped out in about the first five minutes, so I'm no good, that's for sure. you got to bring the shades. <laughs> yeah, but they, that, that's Nobody's going to see those eyes, man. I'd probably give it away. I, gotta... <laughs> <laughs> I got a good story here, too. Uh, lawmakers in action could put homeowners in double jeopardy, and uh, early next year, thousands of American homeowners may be an unpleasant surprise in the mail. A tax statement from their mortgage lender announcing that they may owe tens of thousands of dollars in income taxes. That's scary. And what this is is that Congress acts before the if they don't act before the end of 2015, 
Homeowners who had their mortgage principal reduced in a loan modification or lost their homes through a foreclosure or short sale will find themselves in this position. Wow. Under the federal tax code, when a lender forgives part of the mortgage, the borrower must count the forgiveness as a taxable income. So what we talked about, we talked this with uh, Greg Sinecori mm-hmm. about extending that tax relief. Yeah. And if they don't do it, this could happen. And they're really taking an eye at this because Congress needs to pass this. We still have a ton of these out there where people are foreclosing, short selling in that position. And so they're not coming after them. They really need to look at that idea of extending it because yeah. this could be a big problem. And I believe this is only for primary residents too as well. Yep. So also we have another show. Uh, I got another story I wanted to talk about. It really doesn't have to pertain to Nevada, but we can relate in some ways. Yeah. Uh, we have a California man indicted for big, or I'm sorry, bid rigging at foreclosure auctions. And we've talked about that, mm-hmm. remember? And a California man has been indicted by a federal grand jury for allegedly trying to rig public foreclosure auctions in Northern California between 2008 and 2011. Did you know about that? Sounds like he needs an attorney. I know I know one, too. <laughs> <laughs> Rory. <laughs> Total of 54 individuals have pleaded guilty since the FBI began its investigation into bid rigging in a public foreclosure auction in California. Wow. That's big. That's big time. He's that is big. An additional 21 real estate investors have also been charged in indictments for real, related charges. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Also, boomerang buyers, home buyers. You know what a boomerang home buyer is? Educate me. Okay, so if you really get a buyer come in your office and you throw them, oh, uh, you hope that they come, come back. back. <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> 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 What it is is 1.5 million buyers who lost their homes and credit during the housing crash could re-enter the market. And I think that's a big deal. And this is where we talk about strategic short sales where I've been preaching this years and years ago. Let's go ahead and do a short sale now because Mm -hmm. after your two years, we'll be able to get you another home. Yeah, sometimes maybe less. I got that program mm-hmm. I told you about. Uh, depends if they want to buy some repaired their credit. Now, 700,000 or seven hundred thousand potential buyers are eligible for credit this year to repurchase a home. Wow, that's big. And there will be 2.2 trillion home buyers in the market in the next five years determining if they want to buy a home and get, obviously, credit extended to them. Mm-hmm. Now, what's important about that is there's a lot of people that probably been scarred yeah. by the, the situation where they did the foreclosure. Mm-hmm. Or the short sale. Now they're like, I don't want to come back in and buy. Yeah. And you know what? That's your decision. But yeah. I can tell you, and it's still there, there's going to be a point where you can make that decision and say, you know what? I just want to rent. It's the same as mortgages or my mortgage would be. Yeah. It's still cheaper in a lot of situations to have a mortgage. So if you're going to do it because money's cheap and rates are low. Why wouldn't you do it? Why would you not want to at least yeah. look at the idea? And I think you really got to look at that. Also remember that if you're going to get a short sale or after a short sale for a conventional loan, it's a four-year waiting period. Yeah. You have to have a 10% down payment. Gotcha. Okay? If it's a foreclosure, it's seven years. Mm-hmm. That's important. Also, you have two-year waiting period if you're a veteran. Mm-hmm. That's somebody out there that has the opportunity to get a loan through the military as a veteran. It's a two-year waiting period after a short sale or foreclosure. Also... FHA really is the quickest route, if you're not a veteran, to get back into a home loan, which is yeah. a three-year waiting period. Mm-hmm. And what's this uh, one-day uh, out of short sale period thing? What's that about? Well, we have a program, and I've told you this before, where you put a certain amount down. It's 20% minimum if you have a 680 credit score or higher. Mm-hmm. If you don't have that, then you can go in and say, you know what, I have a 600 or higher, but then you're required to put 25% down. Yeah. Now, if you had a bankruptcy, let's say you had a bankruptcy... Now you're putting 30% down. So if there's a short sale, including in the bankruptcy, and Rory, this could be good information for you, we have a program that you could put 30% down yeah. to get you back into a home. Yeah. And I think that's big. So, I mean, at the end of the day, real estate is just a numbers game, and you've really got to understand the market and what's taking place out here in Vegas. Once you understand the game, you can pl- actually play this game to win. It is. You ready for the market rundown? Let's do this. As always, we start off with the financing news and events. We also go into uh, housing market statistics. I'm going to go over interest rate trending. I'm going to talk to Rory here from Bankruptcy Bulldogs. Uh, Vegas in a declining market. We are in some locations. I want to talk about that. Lender versus realtor face-off, as always. Go through some questions. If you guys have any questions regarding this show, 257-5396. You can also schedule a free 30-minute consultation by calling in 781-6682. If you want to tweet me, 
You can tweet me at 781NOVA, and we put together a nice website. We got a lot of people from past shows on this website. Tell us about that, Chuck. 781NOVA.com. This website provides educational videos, past shows, weekly market stats, selling, buying, and all loan programs. Also, we give away a free appraisal and free home inspection to anybody listening or inquires about getting something from us on the show. If you come in and you fill out an application, I'll give you a free appraisal. Chuck will give you a free home inspection that's big. Also, we give away a free lunch for two to P.F. Chang's. We've done this every week. A lot of people are going and dining on us. Free. If you have any questions, again, 257-5396. Chuck, what's going on in the housing market? The housing market, this is where we bring it play-by-play week to week. Overall, the uh, market right now, we are declined by 2.5%. We have a total of 9,507 properties currently listed on the market. 87% 87% are actually traditional sales, 9.7% are short sales, 3.3% are actually bank-owned properties. We actually sold uh, 800 uh, properties last week, which brings us to a four-and-a-half-month supply of inventory. There you go. Now, the uh, Silverado Ranch location, uh, I want actually wanted to really pull this up because there's a lot of people that are looking to get into the Silverado uh, Ranch area, and they said, hey, can you uh, pull the statistics for us? So... Uh, the total inventory is actually 82 properties currently listed for sale. Only 29% that are actually listed mm-hmm. under 200,000 are only 18% of the market, which is only 15 homes. Right. So this is what we're going to be talking about later on this segment, the, the locations, okay, as far as the price points, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, in average, three bedrooms, three bedrooms, uh, 2,200 square feet, the average price is at 280 at 126 per square foot. The average sold is uh, 125, and the average days on the market is uh, 52 days. The majority of the buyers in today's market, um, you know, it's the average price range is anywhere from 200 to 250. Good. But, Dan, let me ask you this, because the household uh, earners out here in the state of Nevada, according to the Census Bureau, is at $57,000. Mm-hmm. And based upon a debt-to-income ratio where they don't have any debt, I mean, how much could they actually qualify for in today's market? I mean, you're looking at, you're, and what's the price point? Price point? Uh, the price point is at uh, 200 to 250. I'm going to say, you. I mean, you can qualify that no problem. You can probably qualify for a little bit more. Now, because if you have no debt, mm-hmm. and let's say you're making $5,500 a month, yeah, you can definitely afford that that house payment, taxes, insurance, everything included, or even go higher. Now, keep, keep in mind, uh, according to FHA guidelines at uh, uh, $287,500, right. you know, that's where most of the, uh, the market is right now. And mm-hmm. most of the buyers are actually FHA buyers. And these buyers actually want to get into a home right away within 45 days of a fully executed contract. Yeah, and if you're out there and you're saying, well, why, why do I get into an FHA loan versus, let's say, a conventional? Well, conventional, I think, would be a better solution because you can remove the mortgage insurance, and that's a big deal. That's true. But also realize the fact that if you even have an opportunity to get into a home, maybe your credit score is a little bit subpar, Mm -hmm. FHA is a great program. No, it is. And you you have a lot of opportunity with it. With the mortgage insurance decrease that's incurred, Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you right now that the payment's going to roughly be about the same. Now, the only difference is for most people or most situations, obviously, if you have great credit, credit rating comes off a conventional I mean, that's what dictates your your overall uh, mortgage insurance yeah. off your payment. But I can tell you, you're going to be very comparable. And I'll tell you, it makes it look, it's a little bit nicer of a situation now where you, you can justify going an FHA loan, which is a federal housing yeah. association loan uh, that's insured by the government. Uh, it's a little bit easier to, to go that route than it was before. Now, just because you're a conventional buyer, it doesn't mean you're going to get your offer accepted, especially if you're at the price point. 250 and less but if we're shopping around 500 you you are going to have those options where you can actually get a pretty good deal yeah so let me tell you what's going on in the housing uh or not in the housing excuse me the interest rate trending mortgage bonds finished the week higher which pushed uh, mortgage rates slightly lower trading was volatile amid mixed data uh bond prices rose thursday morning following the release of the weaker than expected non-farm payrolls report the U.S. economy added 223,000 jobs below the ex- expectation of 230,000 uh, expected jobs. The crisis in Greece, so we've talked about this the last couple of weeks, provided some support for rates earlier in the week. Why? Well, because if you have anything negative going on in the market, it's always good news for rates and bonds because guess what? Rates are going to start to go down. It looks like it's a little bit better of a situation to put your money in that bond mm-hmm. than, let's say, in stocks or some other things that's going on in the market. So inflation is typically the most important focus for the mortgage interest rate market. Uh, Most of the recent increases in interest rates have come from following stronger stocks, 
strengthen the, the eurozone, and also in response in reports of the future Fed rate increases. And we've talked about September, there's a 50-50 chance that the Fed is going to hike these rates up again. So if you're looking out there and saying, well, should I get a loan or should I look at the idea of getting a loan? I think you should, because I don't know if that's going to happen. But if it does, now you're qualifying and getting approved for less of a loan amount or less of a home purchase. And it doesn't hurt to look to see where you're at, because at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to be bought out the market. And we're, we're, we are running into that situation now. And we'll, we'll talk about that later on in the show. More often than not, when stocks struggle, we see rates improve. And we've talked about that. Yeah. And because people are taking their money and putting into a slower yield, mm -hmm. and that's what they're doing with that, uh, you also got to look at that rising inflationary expectations and an uncertainty about the performance of the bonds cause investors to require higher rates of return on their investments. So that's big. Also, regardless of inflation levels, rising economic activity can increase the demand for investors' funds and thereby lead to higher interest rates as well. So really, the, the demand for money diminishes as the economy struggles, mm -hmm. if you want to put all that together. Yeah. So if you look at the situation over this past week, what's the good news about this is that our rates Im improved by about a one, one half of a point. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's great because it's really good news for us that rates did imp increase or not increase, decrease, and they've improved. And now it's going to allow us to say, look, if you have not looked at the idea of refinancing your home, maybe you look at that now. I'll tell you the window, it, it, I say it, it decreases. We have uh, up and down where as far as rates go. Yeah, Validity is big in rates and how things are traded these days. But I'm going to tell you that overall, rates are still going up overall. And I think you really got to really get on this now. That way we can see if this even makes sense. Now, as a listener, if I wanted to refinance, what's the next step? Well, as always, you got to look at what's the comparable market analysis of your home. And yeah. that's something that you're going to come in with. I'm going to yeah. say, Chuck, you know, can you give me something that shows what is the value of this home and does it make sense? You have to have a certain enough or amount of equity. Mm -hmm. Now, you do have a HARP refinance program that's still there. A lot of people on those have been picked through. Yeah. And I think you got to look at that when you, when you say, well, is this Fannie or Freddie owned? Well, it might not be. Well, you have to go to the servicer at that point. But yeah. if you have at least 5% equity in your home, mm -hmm. you're good. If you, have, if you want to do an FHA refinance, we have that opportunity where you can refinance your rate. You already have typically the 3.5% requirement, mm -hmm. and you can refinance that, that rate. So really, there's no reason out there. I think a lot of people that were upside down, there's still some out there, but they're not there as much anymore. And I think you can take advantage of where rates are at. Money's cheap. Again, I don't know how long it's going to last. We're, you know, low fours, high to, high threes, low fours, starting to head into the mid fours in some ways. Yeah. And I think you got to jump on this because if you don't, you're going to be the person, you know, looking back going, I missed out on that gravy train. That's true. So let's go over and talk to Rory. And I want to talk to him about uh, bankruptcy. And uh, let's introduce our guest. He's currently the number one rated golfer in the world, Rory McIlroy. <laughs> I'm just playing. I just wanted to throw that out there. Do you actually <laughs> golf? A uh, little bit. I'm pretty bad at that, too. So okay. we already talked about how bad I was at poker. I'm pretty bad at golf. So. <laughs> I'm not but that you great. But um, you do bankruptcy well. I do bankruptcy well. Perfect. So, so tell us about yourself, how you got into the business. I'm um, originally from Las Vegas, uh, yeah. second generation. My parents were born here as well. Um, went to law school in Arizona, came back to Vegas during the, uh, I guess, boom years, you would call it, 2003. Uh, worked at a large firm here in Vegas. I uh, was doing a lot of commercial real estate uh, for a lot of clients, purchases, sales, leasing, brokerage, landlord, tenant, you name it, I did it. Uh, okay. then, then I went on to a commercial brokerage uh -huh. here in town. Uh, we were doing a lot of acquisitions, a lot of deals at that time, and then the market fell out. Uh, I started my own firm uh, in 2009 and specialized in helping homeowners who were distressed, okay. doing loan modifications, doing short sales. That brought me into the bankruptcy world as well. Um, so been doing that, uh, those three things mainly for the past six years, I'd say. Mm -hmm. I still do some commercial real estate as well, have a number of clients that are starting to pick up, and that's pretty good. I think it's a sign of the economy right now yeah. that the commercial side is picking up, as well as the residential. And for you guys, I'm sure you guys are seeing a lot more purchases, a lot more buyers. Uh, I'm seeing that. Um, I do specialize in, in short sales, so negotiating those, and uh, most realtors do not like those, <laughs> and, I can, and I can tell them why. I'm not a big fan of them myself either. Uh, but it is a 
you know, an avenue. Uh, I'm seeing less and less of the distressed homeowners. Bankruptcy numbers are are down significantly from the peak in 2006 to 2009. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it is still an avenue. There's still a lot of people with a lot of debt. Um, Now that things are getting better, people are getting better jobs. They're worried about creditors coming after them now that they've kind of weathered the storm and now they're getting back to work. And then, boom, they're hit with a notice of garnishment from some credit card, you know, from six years ago that they thought you know, went away. <laughs> so if they hit, the, if somebody does contact them, mm-hmm. th- and I was told that once the creditor contacts you, okay, that period of time, I guess they have like seven years to try to come after you for the debt, right? Yeah, it's seven years from the last attempt of collection. So, so, so if they contact you, that seven years starts over again? Um, no, it doesn't start over again. So if you have a credit card or somebody that's over seven years old, it's uncollectible. Okay. So, but it doesn't mean that they can't continue to attempt to collect it. Okay. So they could still call you and harass you and file the lawsuit or, you know, they may not be able to win at their lawsuit um, or actually are entitled to anything. But it mm-hmm. doesn't mean I've seen it all the time where creditors are still harassing people 10 years down the road. They could have had a second mortgage that was foreclosed on that they forgot about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these guys have sold it off so many times. And whoever has it now is just looking to get pennies on the dollar. They're seeing anything we can get as a win for them because they, they paid nothing for it. So after know. seven years, it doesn't go off your credit report. It still sticks. Is that um, correct? Or? No. After seven years, you can contest that on your credit report. Okay. So, but you have to go in and be active. It doesn't automatically fall off, although okay. it probably should. Right. Um, you do have to pull your credit, and you can go to annualcreditreport.com. That's the free government one. and pull all three bureaus. It doesn't give you a score. It just gives you your report. Mm -hmm. You can go online and pull that, see what's still on there. If anything's over seven years old, then they have to write dispute letters on each of those debts to get them removed. To the three bureaus. Yep, to the three bureaus to get that removed. I think if you are somebody out there as a consumer, and I've said this before on shows, you got to look at it from a consumer standpoint. If you're looking at your situation, when do you know there's an indication that you need to go and file bankruptcy? That that's a tough question. I mean, most of the time when I see people is when they do have that notice of garnishment or someone's trying to take their car that they're behind on or their house. So usually people are, you know, we, we all do. We're all sort of procrastinators. Sometimes we, when something we're kind of hiding from something until yeah. it's finally right in our face and we have to do it. But as far as, you know, deciding what you want to do, I think it's like pulling off that band aid. Sometimes you have to deal with the situation now so that you can help rebuild later on. Mm -hmm. So filing that bankruptcy and waiting that two or three year period so you can buy a house, you know, you've got to do it now so that you, because these timeframes are in place and you're going to have to wait a while to get things back in place that you're going to want to have to start thinking about that. And do I want a house? Do I want a car? You know, I've got to deal with the repossessions or the foreclosures and get some of the stuff cleared up and cleaned up off of their record. Um, the other real big issue, especially here in Las Vegas, are payday loans and mm. the cheap financing that people have gotten themselves into and the rates that they charge. And it's a never ending circle where they take out one payday loan and then they're taking out another payday loan to pay off the first payday <laughs> loan. <laughs> and then they, and, and, I, and I don't even think they're supposed to be able to allow you to have more than one payday loan. But these places do it. And I get somebody in there with, you know, their original debt was maybe $400. And I say, how much you owe? And they're like, $4,000. Wow. How much are you paying? 400 a week. I said, that's more than what you originally borrowed. Um, and at that point, some of those people really need to file bankruptcy. So talking about bankruptcy, how many chapters are there to a bankruptcy? And what are the difference <clears throat> between those chapters? Well, the primary chapters for consumers or individuals are 7 and 13. Okay. And chapter 7 is what they call the fresh start bankruptcy. It's what most people w- file or want to file. And that's because you are getting that fresh start. It gets rid of almost everything except alimony, child support, Uh taxes that are less than three years old, and student loans. And so as long as you don't have any of those three, Mm -hmm. Chapter 7 is probably the way you want to go. But there are requirements for Chapter 7. You have an income requirement. So you can't make too much money. Mm -hmm. And the median right now for an individual is about Mm $43,000. So anybody that makes more than $43,000, there's a secondary test called a means test. And if you pass that, you can qualify for the Chapter 7 as well. People like the Chapter 7 because it's nice and easy and done in three months. Right. Mm -hmm. And it gets rid of almost everything that you're looking to get rid of, except most people have these student loans, these crazy student loans that they want to get rid of. Um, So with that, uh, it's a three-month process, one court hearing, Uh and you're all set, and you're on your way. So Chapter 13 bankruptcy is for those income earners that are above the median income. Mm -hmm. It's also for any individual who wants to hold on to an asset that they're behind on payments on. So a house or a car, Uh something they've fallen behind on, they want to stop 
the repossession or foreclosure, and you are allowed to take those payments and pay them through a plan and keep that asset. I was going to ask you a question because I've had situations come up where you have a bankruptcy, and in the bankruptcy, somehow they've put the mortgage through the bankruptcy. Typically, a Chapter 7, they don't do that. Is that correct? Exactly. In a Chapter 7, if you want to hold on to your house, you have to be current on the payments. Right. Or work something out directly with your lender to through a loan modification or forbearance. They'll let you keep that house. Yeah. A lot of times, too, when you see that, you see the fact that that payment's not showing up on a credit report because sometimes it's just the lender or the, the client <clears throat> has not reassessed that payment. Mm-hmm. And so now you're looking at them going, hey, I thought you had a payment on this mortgage and you don't see it because when they do include it in the bankruptcy, sometimes it's not there, especially like Mm -hmm. on a short sale or foreclosure. Yeah. And that's important fact is these are called reaffirmation agreements. And a lot of clients aren't educated about it. And a lot of attorneys don't educate their, their clients about them. And most, most times I wouldn't recommend a reaffirmation agreement because at any time you do want to walk away from that house or yeah. a car, you're not liable for the debt. So that's the advantage of not signing a reaffirmation agreement. But from your perspective, Dan, the reaffirmation is good because mm-hmm. without the reaffirmation, they won't continue to report those on-time payments. Right. So you're not helping your credit score and you're not helping if you want to refinance or get to that. So Market Snapshot, this is Dan French. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Market Snapshot. This is Dan French from Nova Home Loans. I'm here with Chuck. It's from Simply Vegas and Rory from Bankruptcy Bulldogs. And uh, Sounds like an ultimate fighter, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he came in looking mean, didn't he? He's I like, was scared. He's like, where's the radio station? <laughs> so if you guys have any questions outside studio, 257-5396, you can schedule a free 30-minute consultation with us at 781-NOVA. That is 6682 if you want to tweet me, you can tweet me at 781NOVA. And Chuck, push that website again. I know it's something you really are putting a lot of heart into. 781NOVA.com. This website provides educational videos, past shows, weekly market stats, selling, buying, and all loan programs. Including people like Rory that you can get in contact with. That's right. So that's right. another good thing for you guys out there. Uh, we have a caller on line one. Let me see who this is. This could be a... This is Dan with the Market Snapshot. Who's this? This is James Jewell. James. James. Oh, Mr. <laughs> Jewell. What's yeah. going on Sunday, man? You dealing with that humidity or what? Uh, yeah, it's a little humid out here, but it's not too bad. Just uh, working on the new house and all that good stuff. Have, right. you, have you utilized that pool yet? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> uh, we had 4th of July and kicked it in the pool and watched everybody else. Like, James, I'm a little disappointed, like, though, man. <laughs> wasn't yeah. invited. I didn't get an invite. <laughs> yeah. I'm your lender for life now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so, James, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, we appreciate you coming and getting a loan and also working with Chuck. It's, you're really the proof of what we have on this show. Uh, when we started, you were you were good on your credit, but you need a couple things that we needed to, to tweak. You got yeah, I there. I wasn't that good. Well, you were. I was okay. I was working on it, but I was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the thing is, is I think we came in. You know, I followed up with these calls, and it's good because it's a free credit services. And you know what? The good thing about that is, is that I told you, listen, if you do this, I'll get you to a point in getting a loan, and then we got you there. And guess what? Chuck was out looking for a home for you, and I think it's a good story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you you recommend me to Chuck, and uh, he did an awesome job. Yeah. So overall, how was the um, your experience with Nova and and us as far as working together? Did you have a good experience? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did, and you guys worked really good together to find me something and keep me in my 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 range that I needed to be in. So. I think and, I think uh, if you look at it, James, too, it's about uh, education. It's also about um, giving good information and trying to really be there for somebody throughout that loan process or throughout that purchase process. And, uh, you know, anytime we have somebody from A to Z, including the credit services that we did, and then all the way getting it to the point of you closing this transaction, it really makes us feel good because, you know what, it's proof to everybody out there that this does work. And I just wanted to tell you, you know, I appreciate you calling into the show. Hopefully you're getting good information if you're listening. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I I, I thought everything was great. And uh, you guys did an awesome job and helped me get my credit up to where I needed to be. And 
and uh, just helped me find a, a house that I really like, and and now I'm happy. Now this this have a house. <laughs> this this file was not a very easy uh, file to close, and and James was you know under that price point where buyers are looking, it was very challenging. But we was actually able to get him a pool too as well, and it really started off with laying that foundation and educating our clients to explain to them exactly what's going on within the marketplace. So that way, when we went out to the marketplace, he knew what to expect. Am I correct, James? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, we tried to do some something a little bit lower, and it was just like everything just kept going and it's like okay this is where we need to be and and uh that's where that's where we went and you're right on the money and james i just want to say too from my standpoint uh you have people that you work with that uh, are not so urgent about getting things and when every time i asked you something i just wanted to tell you that you got it lickety split if you want to say uh very quick and uh so I just want to say, you know, it was a great experience with you. I just wanted to say thank you for calling in and letting us know that we did a good job. And hopefully you keep listening to us. Hopefully you'll keep uh, down the road. You'll be in contact with us. And if you know anybody, friends or family that could benefit from our services, hope you're referring our name. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. You guys are awesome. So, hey, anybody ask, you guys are the first ones I say. All right. Well, hey, I want to say thank you so much, James. And uh, you guys hopefully enjoy your house. Stay cool out there, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon, okay? All right. Thank you very much. Okay, James. You have a good rest of Sunday. You guys too. All right. Let's go back to Rory over here with Bankruptcy Bulldogs, and I got a few more questions with Rory. Um, so, you know, with you looking at creditors, you have to be as thorough as possible when you're putting your listing of how many creditors you have out there, right? Is that correct? Definitely. Okay. And what is what is that something like let's say if somebody comes in and they don't list a creditor and you find out about it they're liable for that debt so there are a couple different situations but you have to be as thorough as possible because the only way we know who to notify about your bankruptcy is if you tell us or if we run a credit report for you and preferably we do both so that we cover all the avenues i mean and if we tell clients if you think you even owe a penny to somebody let us know if you can think about any medical provider any collection company, anything you get in the mail, hold on to it, bring it in, we notify them. Because after the bankruptcy is discharged, if they didn't receive notice of that bankruptcy, uh-huh. then they can come after you and continue the collection efforts. Now, most likely, your case was what they call a no-asset case, meaning nobody got anything from your bankruptcy anyways. Mm-hmm. But if there was an asset that was dispersed to other creditors, and this creditor didn't get their portion of it, even if it was a $0.02 cents or $0.03, cents, then they can come after you for the full amount. And then, you know, and sometimes if it's a $1,000 bill, you've just defeated the purpose of, of maybe filing that bankruptcy. Hmm. So let's say you had a tax refund. Is it always a good thing to do when you say, I'm going to pay friends and family back for maybe money that they've borrowed? Yeah, that's one of the biggest mistakes that people do out there is they get a large tax refund and and, and I've seen them seven eight thousand dollars sometimes. I said, "What'd you do with that money?" And they said, "Well, I paid back my mom." And I said, "Well, that's great. You know, I, I love that you paid back you know your mom for it, and I understand where you're coming from. But if a trustee finds out about that in bankruptcy, they can go back to your mom and say, "Give me that money, mm. or you're going to be responsible for repaying that money." Well, I want to know what CPA they used. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I hear you on that. So, so it's really important, you know, before you go and spend that money to, if you're considering bankruptcy, to talk to an attorney because at least then we can say, "Hey, these are things you can spend it on. You can pay your car in advance. You can pay your rent in advance. You can pay your attorney's fees. You can pay all kinds of things," and not have to worry about the bankruptcy trustee coming after that money later on. So there are ways you can spend it, which is good, yeah. but we just want to make sure that you're not responsible for that money afterwards. Mm-hmm. So you do not, you don't cash out retirement accounts to pay creditors or do you just hold on to it? I mean, is that something, how does that uh, work? So sometimes we get a client who has come in and said, Hey, I, you know, I'm thinking about I only owe $20,000 and I've got $20,000 in my 401k. Mm-hmm. And we say, you know what? That's just taking money and throwing it away. You're take, you're going to pay the penalty for taking it out. You're going to pay the taxes that you would have to pay on that ordinary income. And then, you know, you may not cover all of your debts. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, retirement accounts are almost 100% protected up to at least a million dollars, and not many people have that in their retirement so accounts. So this is really case by case, and it really depends where you are in your life. And you kind of got to run the numbers to see if it even mm-hmm. makes sense and what you are looking to forecast to do yeah. in the near future. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's why I sit down personally with every client and do a consultation with them at least an hour long to go through all these questions to see where they're at, mm-hmm. see what their goals are, see if bankruptcy is appropriate because it may not work for everybody. Right. And I'm not there to sell everybody a bankruptcy. I'm there to give them an honest opinion on what I think that their goals are. And there are a lot of people I have to turn away and say, you know, you're uncollectible. You're only on Social Security. Yeah. You know, you don't need a bankruptcy. You mm-hmm. know? So there are a lot of people, and in, in, uh, one of the best things about my job is I get a lot of people leave and say, I can sleep at night. Even if I didn't get a bankruptcy client out of it, they can say, I know that no one's coming after me, and I know that I have a you know, way to go, and I know where I'm going with it. So you have a, a discharge waiting period to get a loan. And I want to tie this in because you have a two-year waiting period. Mm-hmm. Okay, to get back into a loan. And what people think is like, well, you know, I waited the two years. I'm going to open up credit cards. And they do that. And they establish credit. And a lot of times, the biggest problem that people have when they're trying to get home financing is that they open up other credit or trade lines, and then they're late Mm -hmm. again. And you know what that does for me (laughs) is it really hurts their chances of getting them a home loan because you're trying to prove yourself again. You know, you've wiped away a ton of debt, which is a good thing because Mm -hmm. now you're starting over, like you said, the fresh start. But if you're coming to me for financing and you've already had a a late, even one, I go to an underwriter, they're going to look at it and go, well, you know Mm -hmm. what? That's hard to determine Mm -hmm. because you're you're showing to me that you're showing the same patterns Mm -hmm. of what you were before the bankruptcy when really you're supposed to get that slap on the hand and then start over. Yeah. So that's a big deal. If you're out there and you're thinking about it and you have a late show up, after a bankruptcy, any lender you're working with is going to be difficult because you're not looking at the idea that you're really trying to reestablish yourself. And uh, that's something you got to look at. So are you literally starting all over when you do a, a bankruptcy? No, there are a lot of things. A lot of people think if you file bankruptcy, you're going to lose your car, you're going to lose your house, and they're going to come and take everything out of it. And a lot of people are worried about somebody showing up taking TVs or washing machines out of their house. And <laughs> that's not the case at all. We have, you know, Nevada, very generous, what they call exemptions and stuff that you get to keep. You get to keep one vehicle up to 15000 If you're right. married, you get two cars up to 15000 Your homestead exemption is half a million dollars. So if you have equity in your mm-hmm. house, you don't have to worry about it. So, uh, But you do have to file for homestead. Yes, you do have to have that filed, and you can only have one homestead. So you can't say, I've got an extra house in California that I'm going to homestead. <laughs> Are they trying to pry that granite countertop <laughs> away, too? <Yeah. laughs> so, I paid too much for this. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're out there, and uh, let's say you're somebody that has a lot of credit cards or a lot of credit, um, and we've talked about, you know, do you have the ability to remove some of it and then keep some of it. How, where is that line? Like where, where you say, okay, mm-hmm. you have a ton of credit cards. Some of these are in good standing, but some of them are just, you know, way out of whack and they're just totally, you know, hit their limit. Do you tell some people to do that? Or if it's, if it's all included in the bankruptcy, you say, just do it all together at once. We, unfortunately, we have to include all of it. And I get that question a lot. And some of these people say, well, I, I have this credit card and I, I want to keep it open. I said, unfortunately, that's not up to us. The bankruptcy yeah. code requires you list everybody you owe money to and every one of them has to be be wiped out. Now, whether or not you pay them back after the bankruptcy, mm-hmm. that's something that no one can stop you from doing. So, mm-hmm. for example, somebody might have a doctor that they go to because they're getting cancer treatments, mm-hmm. and they've got a $20,000 bill with them, and they say, okay, well, I am gonna, I have to list everybody, and I, I don't, I'm not going to pay that back. But right. when you go back to that doctor, you know, you have to face them every day, and you might feel that you, you owe them something, and that's something you could pay back after the fact. That makes sense. So if I'm in financing, so I always tell everybody... Don't open up any new credit cards or trade lines. And I also say don't transfer any assets or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Get and wait for instruction by us to do that. So do you do you not transfer assets in preparation of a filing bankruptcy? Absolutely not. That's one of the biggest things uh, that trustees are looking for. They're looking for transfers of assets to family members, friends, relatives, you know, for safekeeping. So if you've 
taken a, you know, you sit down with me and I say, well, this car is not exempt and the trustee is going to have to sell it if you file bankruptcy. They think, mm-hmm. oh, I'll just transfer it to my sister. I said, well, that, that's going to be easily traceable by the trustee. And when you go into the bankruptcy court and they ask you all these questions, everything's under penalty of perjury. And I tell people that's a very serious uh, Offense, char- yeah. charge and you don't look good in orange and I don't look good in orange. So I'm not even <laughs> going to help you with this. And I wouldn't recommend that you do it. So, so if, you, if, you, if you have a bunch of investment properties, there's really no way around it then, basically. Um, as far as the investment properties go, if you have a lot of equity in them, yeah, they're, they're going to be lost in a bankruptcy because they're going to liquidate them. Well, unless if it was in a trust first. Is that correct? Before all this taken has taken place? It depends on what kind of trust it is. If it's a regular living trust and you're the sole beneficiary, probably not. That's going to be an asset that you have. But if it's something like a Nevada special asset trust that's vested over two years, then they can probably keep that. So. We talked about equity. When you say equity, what is a lot? Um, well, for your primary residence and a married couple, it's about half a million dollars. For mm-hmm. an individual, it's 250 So. With that, most people don't have that, but some people do. Okay. So some people do have quite a bit of equity in there. So do you file bankruptcy without talking to an attorney? Now, is that something that people have access to do? And if they do... Why would sh- you even do it? Well, that's what yeah. I... You know, is that something... I've heard somebody actually try to do mm-hmm. that on their own, and I was kind of confused by it. <laughs> Everybody I see that has done it, unfortunately, yeah. usually their case gets dismissed. They haven't done it successfully because there just is a lot of paperwork and a lot of rules to do it. And you don't want to get into a situation where you're losing assets that you don't need to be losing. Mm -hmm. The tax refund, if you're going to get an $8,000 tax refund and you find out a year later they're going to take that from you, that's a pretty expensive mistake. So paying an attorney $1,500 to file the bankruptcy and make sure it's done right is good insurance for you to be able to keep most of your assets and get done with it and not have to worry about the filings and the trustee and what the next steps are, mm-hmm. and then your case gets dismissed, and you've wasted the three hundred dollar filing fee. Wow. <laughs> well, I just want to tell everybody, uh, Roy, how can they get a hold of you if they wanted to get information from you for bankruptcy? Sure. Our telephone number is seven zero two seven three five fifteen hundred, or go to our website at bankruptcybulldogs dot com. Thank you, Rory Volwinkle from Bull- Bulldog Bankruptcy, for coming onto the show today on Sunday. Thank and, you for having uh, me, guys. We'll, it's been we'll a pleasure. De- we'll definitely have you back. I'd love to come back anytime. All right. If you guys have any questions regarding bankruptcy or financing or real estate, give us a call in studio, 257-5396. Chuck, we've talked about Nevada has flattened on existing homes and declined in areas. And you've also seen new home development steadily increasing on certain price point and location, right? That's correct. So most people think it's in a market where values are still going up. I think with the new home purchasing, it is. And it's still going up. The average median price is still in, you know, increasing. But I think we flattened for existing homes. You're absolutely right. And that's why, you know, when we start looking at properties around the 250 range, you know, and that's where majority of the buyers are, what you'll see is there, there's such a high demand and properties are going quickly. Uh-huh. And, and that's just the same as our caller that we just had. You know, he was in that same, you know, situation. Mm-hmm. So as we go down on the price, uh, properties are going to sell a lot quicker. And if they're moving ready, they will sell a little bit above the appraised value. But anything around 250 to 300, you are going to run into that appraisal value. And, you know, there's not that many buyers at that price point. And what happens is I, in a case study right now, I have a listing at 250, right. which is I advise my client, hey, let's start off at 240 because this is where we need to be. This is what the market is bearing. But we've came to an agreement saying that, hey, after 30 days, if this thing does not sell, you are going to reduce the price. And that's our agreement. And at this time, there's no showings. I'll tell you this. Builders sold 527 new homes in Southern Nevada last month. Wow. And bringing this total up to this year, 2360, which is an increase of 8.9%. percent mm-hmm. The average median closed price home was 315000 That's a new home purchase, yep. up 12% from a year earlier. And builders have also pulled 680 new permits in this most recent month, putting the total into 3289, which is 3289, a year to year jump again, 23.2. This is really like a year of the new home purchase. It, it is. And this is why it's very important. If you're going to buy a new home, you need to make sure that you're going to be in this home for some time. But if you're looking to, you know, move in the next three to five years, I don't see that equity coming back. And that's my personal opinion. I mean, you got to look at too. I mean, Nevada's unemployment rank shrunk considerably. Mm-hmm. The economy's improving. Mm-hmm. Uh, they say that the state jobs rate was 7%, yeah. which was, re- it's a lot lower than mm-hmm. what it has been. And I think now you're seeing more homes purchase or 
putting out there and being built yeah. by new home development. And I think that's important because when you see the economy recovering in the way that it is, especially in Nevada, it's putting a frenzy more for people to go out and try to buy that new home. So if you're somebody out there, and let's say you are approved for 200 to 250 yeah, and you're in the market for buying a new home, mm-hmm. but you're still looking at an existing home option, yeah, something that they can purchase that maybe is not a new home, how does that work with new home build? I mean, are they going to get the same home by buying an existing home versus a new home? No, you're going to actually get more bang out of your buck if you actually buy a, a used home versus a new home. Because remember, you're going to pay that premium price. Right. And, and that's where it's going to kill you. And this is why we really stress that, hey, if you're going to live in this thing for the next five to seven years, then right. you probably want to go to new homes. Sometimes people just want something new with the warranty. It's just like buying a new car versus buying a used car. It's mostly preference. But, you know, when you buy a home out here, please, you really got to be educated and you got to take a look at your situation and your time frame of how long you are going to be in this home because you want to make sure that, you know, you're going to get that money back if you are going to sell. When do you think this whole uh, new home development purchasing and, and opening up permits from these builders. When is this going to stop, you think? I think when interest rates gets even higher. And, and that's the reason why this economy is thriving, because money is very cheap to borrow. Mm-hmm. But as soon as interest rates get up to, you know, 6 7%, I'm going to start to see it slow down. Because remember, uh, su- not supply and demand, but, um, you know, your purchasing power is no longer going to be there. Right. Because of the average household income in the and state they, of Nevada. And then it's going to draw people back to start looking at those existing homes again. That's right. And then it might even balance things out. I think we have flattened, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like I told you last show, the appraisals have been coming in a, in a little bit less. Yeah. Uh, I've seen other people in my offices, including just myself, have had appraisals come in a little bit lower. And, and it's really starting to look at things like, well, where you really have to have somebody that can really look at the, the comparable market analysis of a home. Yeah. And if you, if you feel like, you know what, um, if you're somebody out there that is working with a realtor, maybe find out how they're getting this information. Exactly. And that's why when we're out with a client and we submit an offer in a home, we're going to do a CMA, which is comparable market analysis to the home. And at that point, we're going to show, hey, this is what the property's worth. This is what it will price for VA or FHA. But at the end of the day, if you want to go higher, you know, you are taking that risk. And what I call that is redlining. So it's really up to you to, to gamble that money if you choose to go a little bit higher. At the end of the day, we just educate our clients, but they make the final decision. Let's go right into the lender versus realtor face off. You ready for this, Chuck? Let's do this. All right. So why we put this show uh, together is obviously to educate buyers. Uh, This is really this lender versus realtor face off. This is to help people in the market looking to get answers on financing and real estate that maybe you've addressed. Maybe that somebody, you know, came across or it's been asked to us and we're just trying to educate you as the community out there. Again, you can call us in studio if you have any questions regardless, 257-5396. So I had a client ask me about the grant program and how this was started. Uh, The grant program is something that you can get qualified for, Chuck, Mm -hmm. and realize that we've had a ton of people come in and say, you know what, it's a great program, but there's been uncertainty about it. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to emphasize to everybody out there is that if you were told by your lender or somebody out there that it's there is no real restrictions or there's not heavy restrictions. I'm going to say that's false because there is some things out there you need to be aware of. You need to have a minimum credit score, 640. You also need to have uh, it's debt restrictions that are a little bit more restrictive. Yeah. So you can't qualify for as much home. And you do have to stay in that property for five years. And that's a big question that everybody's been asking me. And I'm telling you right now, it's not saying I don't know what's going to happen if you if somebody's trying to audit that. Mm -hmm. But as a lender, I got to tell you, you're required to stay in that home for five years because they're giving you a down payment. Now, how that works, you really have to have money coming into this because you have to have an earnest money deposit. Yeah. That earnest money deposit will be held for that property. A lot of times if you're if you're getting the grant program with the down payment from the grant, now you're covering closing costs. Well, we're always going to try to negotiate those closing costs to be covered. Yeah. But if you don't get all of them covered, you still have to have that overage. Yeah. You also have money for the earnest money deposit. And that's important because guess what? If you don't have it, for one, you have to hold the property. Second thing is, is if you you have to have some money, it's not like you're just going to come there and say, I'm going to buy, you know, I'm going to get this home and I'm not going to come to the table with nothing. But there are case studies where we get into uh, get into a home for clients, less than $1,500. But as the market continues the way it's continuing, anything below two fifty, dollars it's best to come in with your own closing costs. The more that you can save, the better it is. That's true. 
Also, you're going to be paying more for that loan over the life of the loan if you get into that. Mm -hmm. Rates are higher on those. I'm not going to disclose the rate because it changes all the time, but they are higher. The other thing I wanted to talk about is we talked about the case study, which you've talked about, that mm -hmm. we have a lot of these buyers that's coming in $120,000 to $170,000, $180,000 range. Yep. Is, are we? St I've had people come in and say, you know what, I'm just going to give up. I'm, I'm bought out of the market. Okay. And then they are. And then they are. So what is, I want to let everybody know there's still options though. You still have townhomes. You still have options out there that maybe you can put yourself in a position that says, hey, there is a condo or something that maybe you can entertain. Now, condo financing is a lot more restrictive and it's tough. Townhomes ideal. But I think in some areas, there's still a good price or a good purchase for 175, 180. Well, that, that's why it's so important to educate the client and they understand exactly what's taking off, you know, taking place within the marketplace. Sometimes clients want more than they, they can actually get within the market. So they have to cut a couple of things to actually get a home. Now, I don't want you guys to be discouraged that, that are the listeners out there, because here's the thing. It's, it's a starter home. You're going to always step up to a bigger, and better home. We also want to give away a free list to this show only and i'm going to talk about this free cma I like comparable market free. analysis if you're looking to buy or looking to sell this report will identify all properties within the subdivision anything that's being sold pending and contingent status also free appraisal free home inspection we're pushing this we're giving it away I, I know that there's a lot of people out there that maybe don't even understand that process, but once they get into it and they see the value in it, especially when they're getting a loan, it's important. Also, we gave away a free credit services. As a company, I give that away. James is proof that this works. Mm -hmm. Okay, He called in. He was one of those people that needed it. Took him a couple of months. We got him going. Also, we have a free consultation every time. Okay, 30 minutes consultation is all I require. I don't want you to come in there for two hours and we're talking about everything under the stars. <laughs> All right. Has that I happened? can do that. <laughs> but I think your time and my time is a little bit more valuable. It's not saying I won't. Yeah. But you only need 30 minutes for me and I'll help you out. Also, we give a free lunch for two to P.F. Chang's and we're just going to give that away to, to James. There you go. Also, we're going to try to have somebody come on next week that's a builder. It's not confirmed, but we're trying to get this going. Uh, we're going to constantly keep bringing on new people to educate you bring information to you and that way you become a stronger, smarter home buyer. And if you have any questions again regarding us outside studio 7816682 and I want to tell everybody out there, you know, we appreciate you guys listening to the show. You're the one that makes this show. And uh, you know, we'll be here next week. Please tune into our show next week. We'll be here again 12 to 1 o'clock. Want to thank Rory for coming in again and you guys have a good week. Sean Hannity.